Welcome, everyone. Um, this is the Spinach Iconethist 22 virtual conference. You're very welcome to be here. Um, this is session number three, entitled Latin American Collections. And I'm your moderator, uh, Amalia Diaz. And our, um, our helper is going to be Patricia Burke. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Let me tell you some other stuff that you need to know before. Um, this session is going to be recorded for later viewing uh, for you guys to, you know, can access later to see it. Um, and I want to thank all of you to be here and also the speakers. Um, the um, dynamics of this is going to be uh, everyone is going to talk uh, for 10 minutes sharp. Then there's going to be five minutes for questions and at the end of each presentation. Um, and then there's going to be time for transition between presenters. Um, please, if you have any questions um, during, uh, the, the, during the talks, just leave them the Q&A feature that you're going to find at the bottom of your screen, okay? And um, we're going to choose these uh, questions. So we're going to select the questions that can be answered at the end of each talk. Uh, the chat function is also going to be available for technical questions that you may have, or also if you want to initiate conversations um, among the attendees, uh, but please use it judiciously as an interference or <clears throat> inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. And well, if we have any technical difficulties, please bear with any, any of it and enjoy the session. So um, our first, first speaker today is going to be Mike Rutherford. And Mike uh, has a talk entitled The University of West Indies Zoology Museum, an Anglo-Latin American collection. So um, just please give us some minutes to share the screen with um, Mike's presentation. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Um, Buenas noches, bonsoir, buen noche, wherever you are in the world. Okay. So nice to see so many participants. Well, it's uh, 10 o'clock where I am. Uh, I'm hoping to stay up till almost 2 o'clock in the morning, but uh, I think I'll see, to see the last talk. Uh, Patricia, everything okay with the uh, presentation? I'm trying to share and it's saying only host can share. Oh. I just made you host. Okay, let's try her again. Still telling me only who can share, only host. Do I? You should I go out? And I'm, come I'm back gonna in? give it a try. Let me okay. Well, uh, Mariana or Talia, it says host disable attendee screen sharing. Do I need to screen share? So, wait, I cannot do it. I transferred the host to Patricia, so I am no longer the host. <laughs> oh, um, okay, okay, it, but it's letting me do it now. So here okay, we go. Good. Great. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. 
present. Okay. All right. Good to go. Uh, well, hello again, everybody. I, so my talk today is the UWI ZM and Anglo Latin American collection. I, just a, a way of kind of trying to squeeze you into the session and you'll see why um, in a minute. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. So just to start off with my connection with the University of the West Indies Zoology Museum is that I was the curator of the collection from 2010 until 2019. I, until I moved back to Scotland, where I am currently. Um, and today's talk is just uh, really because I wanted to continue to raise awareness about the collection. Um, so I'm going to look at the Zoology Museum history, its collections, the resources it has, a few regional projects and collaborations that be involved in, and the current context. But mainly it's just to sort of keep the museum um, on everyone's uh, horizon. Okay, next please. So, the University of the West Indies Zoology Museum is the de facto national zoological collection for Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, this image here shows the main zoology room. Uh, it's a sort of mix of all sorts of different groups of animals. It's got mostly spirit specimens, dry specimens in here, uh, vertebrates. It's got a few archaeological specimens. You can see the uh, human skeleton, the Baumari burial, very famous archaeological skeleton in the bottom corner. And uh, so that's the main collection for the country. Uh, next, please. And just uh, to familiarize anybody who's not aware, uh, Trinidad and Tobago is uh, the small islands right at the very bottom of the Caribbean chain, only a few miles from the Venezuelan coast. So biogeographically, uh, are very much a part of South American mainland. So subtle differences in the wildlife, but a great and um, comparative place for zoological research. Okay, next, please. And just the, the background of the collections, uh, it's based at the St. Augustine campus, uh, which was founded in the 1920s. And it's originally the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture. Uh, so this meant that there were scientists and staff from all over at the time of the, the British Empire sending specimens and being educated um, at, at the Tropical College. And they had specimens from Africa, from Asia, from all over the world. Uh, so they had good insect collections to begin with, and then it expanded to cover other groups as um, teaching increased and time went by. Eventually, the campus joined with Mona Campus and uh, Cavehill in Barbados and Jamaica to become the University of the West Indies in 1960. And currently, the Zoology Museum is part of the Department of Life Sciences in the Sciences, uh, Faculty of Science and Technology. Next. I, there's other collections on campus, including the National Herbarium of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, which has over 70,000 herbarium sheet specimens. Many of these are catalogued and available online. There's also an archaeology collection and the general campus museum historical specimens. Next. But today I'm just going to be looking at the zoology museum. So you saw the picture of the main zoology room. There's also a second room, the land arthropod room, the insect room. Uh, and overall, there's around about 70,000 specimens. Uh, many of these have been catalogued, but there's still many drawers and cabinets of particularly insect specimens that are still needing photographed, digitized, and, and worked on. So there's a lot there to discover. It's open to the public, but uh, it's really more of a, as a, a storage collection, uh, and we just let the public come in to look behind the scenes, as it were. We don't have a proper natural history museum type display set up. Um, okay, next. The strengths of the collection, we've got a good uh, range of um, reptiles, amphibians, especially the snakes and lizards from the Trinidad, but also the wider region. A uh, very good collection of freshwater fish, but also marine as well. A uh, good range of bats, uh, both in spirit and dried ones, and lots of, green, uh, lots of mollusks. That was my particular area whilst I was there. I worked on uh, terrestrial mollusks, uh, um, but there's got many marine species as well. And then good collections of uh, Lepidoptera, Coleoptera, and Hymenoptera amongst the insects. Uh, but all major groups are covered. Uh, we also have you know, a good range of bird skins, uh, various marine invertebrates, and so on. Next. And within the Zoology Museum, there's other collections that have been amalgamated from other uh, institutions and bodies in the country. Uh, first of these is the Carrick Collection. This was built up by the Trinidad Regional Virus Laboratory in the 50s and 60s. 
uh, and they undertook work throughout the country to look for vectors, to look for um, viruses, and so they collected a whole range of animal specimens. Uh, they became the Caribbean Epidemiology Center, um, and uh, they eventually got to the stage where they didn't use the collection much anymore. Uh, they had over 5,000 specimens of vertebrates and invertebrates, uh, and they decided to move these to the zoology T12 for better care uh, and preservation. Next. Uh, the other collection, similar story, the CABI collection, which was part of the Commonwealth Agricultural Bureau International, their Trinidad office uh, or, or uh, business. They assembled specimens from the 1950s to the 1980s, um, approximately 40,000 insects, uh, mainly Lepidoptera, Hymenoptera, but very good collections in, in all the major groups. Uh, you can see just a small selection of it there in the photograph uh, before it was transferred into the, the Zoology Museum. And again, it was. Um, lack of use at the, the, their base and a lack of dedicated officers to look after them, so it's decided it would be better cared for uh, being moved to the university. Next. And then finally, the other big collection that came in more recently was the Trinidad and Tobago National Museum and Art Gallery. It has a small natural history gallery in the main museum in Port of Spain, the capital, uh, but there's been no natural history curator for decades. Um, they have uh, around 6,000 specimens of insects, mollusks, vertebrates, wet specimens, and some of these dating back over 100 years. So it's some quite significant stuff. Um, but again, it was it's suffering um, in its current state, so decided to move the specimens to the Zoology Museum in 2014. Uh, and my staff and myself undertook a lot of conservation work, uh, rehoming, rehousing lots of specimens, uh, and it's all off storage stuff, off display stuff is now all at the Zoology Museum. But they still have the, the natural history gallery gallery in town. Next. So the current staffing, um, after our I, but a lot of the pressure pressure and a lot of the, the work now falls upon one technician pictured here is uh, Jenna Lee Ramnarain. Uh, she does a wonderful job of maintaining the databases and maintaining the specimens themselves. Next. And this is the database we use currently, or use at the time, is Past Perfect 5.0, meant to be a general um, museum database so that other collections within campus could use it as well. We've got over 40,000 records and they include some non zoology museum specimens, such as those at the Barkant Butterfly Collection which is a famous butterfly collection stored at the Angostura Distillery, strangely enough, um, but over 15,000 records of their butterflies are added to the database as well. So lots of good information in there. Next. The Zoology Museum information is accessible through the website, gives you information about collections, history, and so on. Next. But the main part of interest is probably the collection level descriptions. Uh, this gives this page gives um, succinct information about each major group, like how many specimens we have and roughly what it includes. So very good for a starting point for any researcher. And then there's also access to some of the online catalog, uh, although not all of it yet. I'm still hoping that the uh, IT technicians in the library at the university will update and, and progress as time goes by to make more records available. Okay, next. The museum also has the obligatory Facebook page, uh, which is used for news, identification services, and just the weird and interesting objects and stories. I, it's not been quite as busy since I left, but I'm hoping that as time goes by, I will get um, used again. But it's a good uh, point to go in and find out more about the collections. Next. And we have many local partnerships, uh, object loans, displays, and conservation advice to other I just um, other groups and organizations in the country, such as the Ace Right Nature Center. Um, we also help with cataloging. Uh, and we always try to reach out to um, a similar types of collections in the, in, in the area. Next. OK, so the regional projects and collaborations that we undertook over the, the last few years, it's a few of them, just a wee snapshot. And um, first one being next. The uh, Global Biodiversity or Biodiversity Information Facility Bid Project. This is a big project. Some of you may be aware of GBIF, I'm sure. Uh, and a few years ago, they had funding for projects in the Caribbean. 
I, and Trinidad, along with Suriname and Barbados, had a, a regional project where we collaborated and uploaded as many specimens. So almost 21,500 specimens were uploaded from zoology museums. This is our, our, our good quality data. And many of those included specimens from Latin America. So there's lots of, particularly insects, astronomy insects, but a few other odds and ends as well. Next, please. Uh, and there was a big recent uh, conference in 2018 based at the campus, uh, the Latin American and Caribbean Congress of Conservation Biology, the tongue twister. Uh, and this was again to try and strengthen the connections between um, Latin America, the rest of America, the Caribbean, and get researchers more aware of what other people were doing in, in the neighborhood, as it were, in the region. Okay, next. And then the main sort of collaborations I, I was involved in in my time um, there with people in the rest of Latin America were really sort of loans, uh, tissue samples from specimens in Trinidad, specimens, whole specimens going on loan. I, and this helped in um, many papers. Uh, this is just a, an example of one, the phylogeny of the cascaded tree frog, that was the golden tree frog um, included in that. I, and this is of something I hope will continue. Um, there are many uh, capable and interested scientists and natural history enthusiasts in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and making local contacts with them through the museum, through the university. Um, if researchers need a particular species, for example, to complement the work they're doing on the mainland, I'm sure there'd still uh, be people out there in, in the university. Uh, excuse me, Mike, you yep. have one minute, one minute okay. left. Uh, so request welcome. Okay, next, please. So in future, hopefully more regional collaborations. Um, obviously in this uh, pandemic times and strange times, virtual tours and displays are the way to go. Uh, and hopefully more updates and database and GBIS. Big question, um, when and if there'll be a new curator. Unfortunately, like many universities around the world, funding is becoming going to become more of an issue. Um, so I'm not sure when and if there'll be a new curator, but I hope it's soon. Uh, in the meantime, I hope they'll at least get some more technicians to keep working. I, I'm, yeah, because there's a lot, lot more to research. Uh, next, please. And this is just the main contacts at the moment. As I mentioned, generally around the Rhine, the main zoology room technician, Rajendra Mahavir, the current land arthropod room technician, but also a chief technician, and Professor Judith Gobin, head of departments of life sciences. So they can all be contacted through the website or through the zoology museum uh, email at the bottom of the page there. Okay, next one. Find the slide. That's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, so, uh, given our given our technical difficulties at the beginning, um, we only have a couple of minutes left to be on time. Uh, but there is one question. Um, Dirk Newman from yeah. the Bavarian. Um, Natural History Collections is asking, what okay. are the long term, what are the long term perspectives for this very nice and well curated collection? Will the void curator position be filled soon again? I, well, I really hope so. I, when I was uh, hanging up my affairs in Trinidad and finishing off, I really did push with the current head and the uh, dean of the faculty to make sure the position was advertised and, and went. Um, out to the end as soon as possible. Uh, but I think budget constraints, budget issues were the part of the problem, um, which I don't really take as a, a good argument because I was on tenure and I could have been there for the rest of my career. And um, so they must have had the money somewhere. Anyway, let's not get into that. But I hope that uh, that position will be advertised soon. And we can only hope that um, the more people, like all you people here watching today, if, if you want to do research in Trinidad or get involved there, I'm Keep questioning the university and ask them where's the curator. And the more pressure they get, the more likely there is for someone to be uh, brought into play. Great, thank you, Mike. Okay. Um, so we're moving on to our next speaker. Um, yeah.
I'm I'm not hearing anybody. Um, PJ, are you having technical issues? The sound uh, just stopped on me. I don't know if I can hear you, but I couldn't hear Amelia. Okay. Oh, here well, I am. Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you now. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I was just presenting Alberto, and um, you can just go ahead. We, uh, with the presentation, uh, I just want to make sure since you are a host uh, that um, we can uh, put um, Mike's video off and have Alberto on. Perfect. Okay, Alberto, we're ready. No, it's not this presentation. Wait, my this is Catalina's. Looking ahead. You're right. There's sound that's the presentation is not ready. Sorry. Patricia, I can I can oh, hear you. Um, okay. I am I'm tell me the title of your uh, is looking it? ahead. Looking oh, ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Sorry. It they've got out of order. Okay. Okay, that's it. There you go. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Alberto. I'm a researcher from Museo Geodi, or Geodi Museum. And um, my presentation today is talk, talk a little bit about the past, the present, and mostly about the future, which is one of the, the most important things about this, the formation of the society. So, next, please. So the Goethe Museum is the second oldest Brazilian uh, science museum and in the oldest Amazon scientific institution in Brazil. Uh, next. So uh, the museum dates from 1866 uh, and there's actually two 
birth birthdays or dates. The first one is this. Uh, it was a society founded by Domingo Soares, Soares Ferreira Pena. Uh, and he was inspired by European naturalists into the Amazon and American uh, naturalists. Actually, uh, he was um, totally motivated by the entire expedition uh, from the Harvard, uh, Harvard Museum, uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology. Oh, next, please. <clears throat> and the second date of the birthday of this museum is uh, 1871, when the Pará state governor officially created the Museu Paraense. Uh, and Domingos Soares Ferreira Pena was nominated, not the first director, he was like a manager. So next, please. The true scientific first director was Emil Gelge. He was a Swiss naturalist. Uh, he was a, a graduate student of Ernst Haeckel. So he had some evolutionary theory background and Gelge incorporated European natural history museums philosophy in the Museo Gelge Museum, actually was Museo Paraense at, at that time. Next, please. And he was also interested on good zoologists and botanists. So he, he hired Jacques Hubert, he was an important um, botanist, and Emilie Snetlesch. Emilie Snetlesch was an incredible woman. Uh, she was also a graduate student of Ernst Haeckel. And after Hubert's death in 1914, she, she spent five years as the director of, this, of the museum and was the first female director responsible for a scientific institute, institution in South America. She was a bright and a tough woman. Alberto, I think we've lost your audio. Audio also. Okay. So, next. next. Okay. okay. So, so, from 1921, 1921 to 1930, the museum was stagnant for a long time. In 1931, Magalhães Barata, the gov state governor, changed the name, name to Museu Paraense Emilio Gelge. In 1954, the museum was designated as a part of the INPA, which is the National Research Institute of Amazon, in Manaus, Amazon State. For almost 30 years, the museum was part of this institution. Uh, in 1983, the museum regained its autonomy reporting to the Brazil CNPq, which is similar to National Science Foundation of the United States. Only in 1999, the museum reports to direct to the, the federal government and the Brazilian Science and Technology Ministry. Next, please. So about the visual identity of the museum. So, so you, you can see this, how it changed through the years. During the 150 years, of foundation of the museum, we have a, 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 a logo. And next, please. This is the actual new logo that is more modern, whatever. Some people like it, some people doesn't, but whatever. Next, please. 
And this is the research campus. Uh, almost all these buildings have collections. So we have many collections. Next, please. Next. Okay. So the uh, biological collections are all ad ad adopted, all collections adopted specified to create distribution maps. Next, please. Uh, also, we have some digitized information uh, as QR codes available for uh, anyone who wants to know a little bit of this uh, collection. Also, specify our Earth to create low forms for low material. And also, our collections use specify any. We publish the data in JBIF and CDBR, which is the JBIF node in Brazil. Next, please. So, we have some challenges today. What's the maintenance, informatization, and available of this information? We have 18 scientific uh, collections with more than 5 million records. Uh, currently, we have 1.5 million records available in, in the zoological collections. We have something like 180,000 uh, executes all digitized. We have some uh, anthropological collections and archaeological collections, is 150,000. And we also have a paleontological collection with more than 4,000 uh, specimens. We have some, some archives with 5,000 documents and um, a library of, of, of something like 100,000 books. Uh, next, please. So here's a, 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 a something like uh, how the collections are represent, represented in the music, music, Guild Museum. So uh, uh, about 800,000 records are published in CBR, which is the Brazilian node of JBF. And 235,000 samples are digitized and they have images from the herbarium and from the entomological collections. Next, please. One minute. So this is not for everybody to take a look in the details, but we have 11 collections, 49 sub-collections with uh, specimens from vertebrates, invertebrates, fungi, plants, and some mm, fossils, micro and macro fossils. So this is the x-ray of the collections. Next, please. So one of the important things is the partnership that uh, the Guild Museum has with the CBR. CBR is the Brazilian Biodiversity Information System, which is the Brazilian node of the JBIF. Uh, this, this, this system has 186 data sets, from which 49 are from the Guild Museum. Next, please. One of the important things that we do in the, the Guild Museum is describe the, the Amazon biodiversity. So from 
in five years, something like 300 new species, 11 genera and one family of animal and plants. These are appro approximately what we described in these five years. So appro approximately around 500 species in 10 years. Next, please. So we have doing research based on grants and fundings from, from uh, CNPq and other uh, agencies, but we have some agencies funding uh, upgrades on the collections. Next, please. So looking at the future, the future is cryogenic, so we have three of these uh, large cryogenic drums for uh, around 40,000 samples, for t tissue samples storing in liquid nitrogen. Next, please. Mm, sorry, Alberto. Oh, oh this is, uh, running, we have some time, tissues Alberto? preserved in normal freezers and two ultra freezers, which are not good in Amazon because they tend to burn when there are some problems with electrical wiring. Next, please. Well, Alberto, can you hear me? I don't know what, what happened there, but next, please. Alberto, I, I think uh, Amelia need, wants you to wrap it up. Yes, you're, you're run out of time, Alberto, so we need to wrap it up and see Next. if we have any questions for you. Okay, so um, unfortunately, uh, well, we we'll run out of time and couldn't, couldn't finish the presentation, but uh, we saw Plenty and it's wonderful. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions for Alberto. We have two minutes before we start the, the next one. So um, if you have any questions, please go to the Q&A section. Um, some people say here, uh, well, Mike is an impressive collection. Thanks for sharing. And yes, thank you, Alberto, for sharing this. This is wonderful. Um, so uh, let me introduce you. Uh, to our next presenter. Um, she is uh, Janelle Peña, and the title of her presentation is Insights into the Amphibian Biodiversity Crisis from a Small Collections Perspective. Uh, Janelle should be here today uh, for some reasons she's not, but she left a video. So um, Patricia, if you can find it, it's, um, let me let me tell you what's the title of it. Um, I can, I can, Put it on. It's, okay, great. Yeah, that's the one, but there's no audio. Did we get the buttons, Mariana? We might need to restart it. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> oh, hey, Janelle. Hey, So you guys get my video? Yes, look at it. Um, Hello and good afternoon. As I'm sure you, you all know, over the last half century, amphibians have undergone drastic declines across the globe. In fact, at this moment, approximately 41% of described amphibian species are threatened with extinction. This makes amphibians as a whole the most vulnerable vertebrate group 
a superlative that applies doubly to those species that inhabit tropical forests. Unfortunately for us in Puerto Rico, the prognosis of future climate scenarios do not favor Caribbean amphibians. Our region will be facing increasingly frequent droughts and extreme weather events. And among myriad additional compounded factors and effects, these events are but the tip of the climate change iceberg that our amphibians will need to confront to survive. So before things get too sad, I'm going to tell you a story. A story of deforestation and regrowth, of discovery and loss, and of knowledge gained and preserved. But it won't be one of those typical stories that have one main character. Rather, this story has an ensemble cast. 17 to be exact. This cast belongs to the genus Eleutherolactibus, derived from the Greek meaning three fingers. All of these frogs live in Puerto Rico, and we collectively call them coqui, a living symbol of our island, culture, and indigenous history, to the point that merely hearing the call will elicit a smile of instant recognition on our collective faces. Biologically, they're similar to most other anurans, frogs, in that most live in very specific habitats, while a select few are found essentially anywhere on the island. Though what separates them from others is a specialized reproductive strategy, direct development, which allows them to emerge from eggs as a tiny froglet, completely skipping the tadpole stage. However, to understand their current challenges and our understanding of their ecology, we have to look back in time. Puerto Rico was heavily deforested by the late 1940s due to the need for hardwood to construct boats, with forest cover shrinking as low as 6%. Somehow, our intrepid cast managed to survive through this hardship, and thanks in part to a switch into a service and industrial dominated economy, forest recovery soon began in earnest from the 1950s and onwards. By the 1960s, scientists were drawn towards the island for the potential of describing and discovering species. A great example is Dr. Richard Thomas, a herpetologist responsible for having collected over 15,000 specimens all over the island, a Herculean effort that earned him a spot as the greatest contributor to our current collections. But it was during this time, and thanks in part to collection efforts such as these, that we slowly began to notice something was a mess. For some reason, in the late 1970s, we started losing species, beginning with Coqui Parmiao, a large, dark-colored, semi-aquatic frog with webbed hind legs. The only Coqui, and one of only four Electrodactylus from the Western Antilles with that attribute. Then, though the forest continued their recovery, we lost another in the 1980s, the Coqui Dorado, another small, beautiful golden yellow colored frog that just so happened to be the first of a viperous anurin described in the new world, meaning its eggs hatched internally and it gave life birth. In the 90s, yet another was lost, the coqui de Eneida, a moderately sized chestnut colored montane frog with mottled skin and brows. The losses were one species per decade. This seemed so fast that most publications and current encyclopedic repositories have yet to report them formally extent, though the oldest hadn't been observed in over 40 years. And although the modern forest cover is back up to the highest level since the 1940s low, 75% of the remaining coqui are categorized by the IUCN between vulnerable and critically endangered, with populations trending down and all of that is using decades old data. So why were they disappearing? Was it because of the deforestation, even though later reforestation didn't aid recovery? Were their populations weakened following the deforestation and then dealt final blows decades later? Did urbanization and encroachment by humans force them into successively constricted ranges? It turns out that we weren't alone. These questions had resonated all over the world among herpetologists. Bizarre die-offs were being recorded in pristine forest habitats, especially those within the neotropical regions. Such events were labeled enigmatic declines. 
It wasn't until 1989, at the first World Congress of Herpetology, when the alarm was rung and it became a known concern that frog populations were declining at an unprecedented rate. Through all this, little did we know that hidden inside our museum collections was direct evidence implicating a culprit. These specimens are all that remain of the first coquille to go extinct on the island. And in the 2000s, their skin was swabbed. Spores from a now well-known fungus, Patacochytrium dendrobatidis, BD, were found. This fungus causes chytridomycosis, an emerging infectious disease where the outermost layer of skin is severely affected. If they become heavily infected, frogs can lose their ability to breathe, hydrate, regulate electrolytic balances, and thermal regulate. So these extinct museum specimens in our collection now represent the first record for the island. And not only did we get the oldest record, but studies with our collection shows how widespread it was across various other species, including to the present day. Thankfully, subsequent empirical studies have shown that there is variation in host response to BD infection within and across populations meaning that not all species of frogs are vulnerable to BD. Interestingly, this includes at least one of the species on the island, the Coquicomu. Although our museum collections have provided to the growing body of literature that implicates BD in amphibian declines, we know that it is one of various factors that often blur and intersect with the ones mentioned before, habitat shifts, increase in urbanization, and climate change. These may compound to produce synergistic effects, resulting in local extinction or worse. This is precisely why collecting amphibian specimens for natural history collections, especially local ones, is so important. Having a traceable and well-sampled record of declines across decades at the local and global level can lay the groundwork for future researchers to use novel techniques to answer questions regarding our ever-changing biodiversity. While our collections have proven invaluable in the search for answers regarding the declines in our most beloved frog, there are still many challenges ahead. Maintenance and organization of our collections has not been consistent over time, as funding has occasionally flowed but mostly circled in. There's also inherent challenges in the collection and study of these highly endangered organisms. That being said, we're in the process of making our databases available online. And in the future, we'd welcome any researchers working on the amphibian crisis to visit us or take samples from our collection. Lastly, the only specimen that we lack is the extinct Coqui Dorado, Eleutorodactylus jasperi. Though Richard Thomas collected tens of thousands of specimens, which we have cataloged, that one species in specific is missing. It seems that at least two specimens from his collection made its way to the KUBI Herpetology Collection in Kansas. The other few specimens that exist, not counting the holotype used to describe the species, are found in various other institutions. If you work in their collections or represent any of these institutions, let's talk. We would appreciate potential exchanges to repatriate a part of our biological heritage. Regardless, having gone and still undergoing massive changes and loss, snapshots of the remaining ensemble cast, including extinct and extinct species, are here in our collections. Wait. Well, that was great, Danielle. Thank you very much. We have some comments here. Exemplar presentation uh, from uh, Vladimir. Uh, great, Danielle, from Alberto. Um, fantastic presentation, wonderful talk. And we have um, two questions in the Q&A section. Um, can you hear me well, uh, Danielle? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Great. Uh, so the first one comes from Gail Huckerby, and she's asking, uh, what is the method of preservation for these frogs that can enable the fungus to remain on their skin to, their day, to this day? Well, we typically use 70% uh, ethanol 
Um, that's what we typically use in our collections. Um, we have a very small collection compared to the other institutions that are gathered here today. Um, we only have like approximately less than 100,000 specimens. So we don't really have a lot of different techniques of conservation. We just use ethanol 70%. Okay, great. Um, Deborah, Deborah Paul is asking, uh, where will you be publishing your biodiversity data? Well, we are partnering up with IDIG Bio. Um, currently, we are putting our databases with them. So that's who we are working with for now. Um, does okay. that answer the question? IDIG Bio is, is who um, we're working with. Yes, okay, great. Um, and there is a third one uh, from Sol uh, Chunk of the way this, this screen is moving. Okay, very interesting presentation. How do you think we can contribute to uh, life the society understand the meaning and importance of collecting? Well, I think we should just start by looking. Everyone should look at those animals that are mostly in, you know, in danger. In our case, you know, amphibians are mostly that are the animals that mostly populate here in Puerto Rico. So we use we like to use the coquille a lot as a symbol for, for that type of fight. So I would say look for stories, good stories that can help animals put, you know, they're out there for us to help them out because the frogs aren't the only ones, of course. We have mammals, we have birds, you know, fishes. Every, every, every species right now are, are going through a really hard time. So it's their stories that need to be heard is what I think that we need to look more and show the public. I mean, people love to hear stories about animals. So it's just to find the right way and the right words to attract the public into helping with this crisis. Yes, absolutely. Um, and well, your, your video was wonderful. Um, I you was have, wondering. Oh, yes. I was just gonna say, Amalia, we have one question from one of the panelists he put in the chat because he we can't access the q a if you're a panelist so um from mike okay um he asks are invasive species of frogs a problem like in other parts of the caribbean yes oh my gosh that is a huge problem um we have the cuban tree frog um we have the bullfrog you know we have have a whole bunch of invasive species here um not only frogs we also have um the green iguana, that's a big problem here in Puerto Rico. We have, we have lots of invasive species. Um, and yeah, we are still working. We still have to keep working with, with all those um, animals. They're, they're not the only ones though. We have pigs and all kinds of, all kinds of invasive species, you can imagine. It's, it's very hard, you know, coming from an island with, with not a lot of resources, of course. Yeah. Great, uh, thank you, Janelle. And um, since we have uh, seven minutes before uh, the next presentation, there, here in the Q&A section is a, is a question for Alberto. So Alberto, are you there still? Let me see, there you are. Um, Alberto, I'm I'm here. I was okay. I, I was I have some problems. Okay, great. So, uh, the, the, I'm gonna read the question for you. Um, it says, what are the strategies and perspectives for the future of the Goldin Museum in face of the current Brazilian government and Amazon destruction? Oh, well, we, we we can do as much as we can uh, uh, in legal terms. What we are doing is actually working if. Uh, helping conservation policies and we have a, a large collection to support us. We, are, we, we go to the field, we, we do a lot of research related to conservation uh, and that's what, what we can do because when the government is playing against you, it's quite, kind of difficult, it's, it's truly difficult. So that's it. We try to survive. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you, uh, Janelle, and thank you, Alberto, for answering the question. Uh, so let me introduce you our next speaker, uh, who's uh, Mariana, Mariana Di Giacomo, um, and she's um, presenting a talk entitled Taking Care of Ground Slots and Glyphodons, Conservation, Research, and Outreach at the Arroyo del Vizcaino Collection in Uruguay. Um, so yeah, we have five minutes before that. Yeah, I think we should wait a little bit um, in yeah. case. Uh, but I think if there are other conversations in the chat, we should definitely um, explore those. And thank you everybody who's here. Um, we have 264 participants. So keep on sharing where um, you're from and where you're uh, participating from, uh, which are two different things, not necessarily always the same one. Um, so. Yeah, just keep on sharing and asking questions. Um, I will now start uh, working on the, the presentation. Give me one second. Yeah, sure. If any of you remember that one has a question for any of the previous speakers, you can just leave them in the Q&A and we are just check them later. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to start early and slowly so I don't say anything too important before the, the time of my talk. But um, if you let me, I, I can keep on speaking. Um, so the first thing I want to say is thank you everybody uh, for being here. Thank you to my co-authors and um, everyone that made this uh, presentation um, possible today. So I'm very, very excited to be here and to be presenting um, on this topic. Um, there you have all the names of the co-authors and there are three Twitter handles that you can use to communicate with us um, at Arrocho Vizcaino, at Megafauna 3D, and my personal one is at Mariana Di Giacomo. Um, so we're really, really excited to be talking about uh, conservation research and outreach at the Arrocho Vizcaino collection in Uruguay. Um, I am a volunteer for this collection. I am currently at the Yale Peabody Museum. I'm the natural history conservator. And um, I used to work at this collection when I was back in Uruguay. So it is my pleasure to be able to present to you um, some of the work that uh, I was able to do and some of the work that I help with um, remotely uh, with everybody in the collection. So like I said, I'm gonna start slowly. So once we hit the, the you know, mark for the beginning of my talk, I'll just uh, go a little faster. Um, the Arroyo de Lizcaína collection is located in Uruguay, in South America. And the closest town to the, well, the collection is in the town of Sauce. Sauce means willow tree. It's not a sauce, I promise. And um, this place is the location where the collection is because it is the closest town to the place where the fossils were found. So the collection is mainly based, 99% um, of bones that were collected in one single site, the Arroyo del Vizcaino site. This site is, uh, was dated at 30,000 years before present. And currently the collection holds um, around 2,000 bones collected from this site. Still not at 6 p.m. <laughs> but, um, what have we found in this uh, collection? We have megafauna. So we have ground sloths, we have glyptodons, we have um, horrors, uh, uh, some sort of deer, uh, toxodon, which is a very, very unusual South American mammal, um, some mastodon, and um, we also have uh, 
one of my favorite fossils in the collection, which is the fang of a saber-toothed cat. But the reason why the Lestodon is at a uh, bigger size in this slide is because the great majority of the fossils that are found in the site belong to um, these animals. Here you can see some of the amazing preservation of the fossils in the site. Um, you can see the carapace fragments from uh, Glyptodon. We have more than one. There's several of those. Um, the hemi mandibles are also preserved beautifully. Um, the teeth are in great shape. And the vertebrae, you can see those vertebrae there. There's a lot of detail in those bones. And again, some of my favorites, I am holding them in my finger right there, are middle of the year ossicles from um, the Lestodon, which is this ground sloth. We found those inside um, the skull of one of these Lestodons. So we were um, working with the preparation and we started finding the, mirror, the middle ear ossicles, which was incredibly exciting. But how did this collection come to be? Why um, are we presenting uh, about this collection? Well, this started in 1997 in uh, South American summer, which would be the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and there was a big drought and the farmers in that area uh, were using the water from the Arroyo del Vizcaino stream. Um, they were using the water to water their crops because this drought was really, really severe. And as the waters started leaving the stream bed, all these fossils appeared. I can only imagine how amazing it would have been to be there and see all these giant bones uh, looking at you from the bottom of the stream. And since it was summer and the high school kids were off school and they rushed over there and they started collecting. And you can see in some of the images over there, they're some of them taken from VHSs because they were uh, filming and they were incredibly excited about this. And if you look at the image um, on the right, you'll see that they're standing on mud and bones. That's essentially what it is. And on the left, you can see all those VHS images and they were starting to look at the bones and see some weird marks on the bones and they got really, really excited. And they got so, so excited that um, they even started their own catalog and field diary. And this is absolutely amazing because these are 13, 14 year olds that are interested in um, preservation and preparation of the remains. So they're keeping a catalog saying, okay, we have some, this many mandibles, these many vertebrae. They're incredibly um, fascinated with what they're finding and finding all these uh, marks. So in the image of the right, you can see um, that's the first collection storage room. Um, it was at the, at the house of the grandmother of one of the students. She had this empty room and then they put all the fossils there and they cleaned them. And um, so they were having um, not only a lot of fun, but they were experiencing a lot of learning. And um, they were also communicating with scientists, with paleontologists, and they were documenting all of this in this field uh, book. And so there's beautiful information about how this collection came to be. And Later on in 2011, um, a group of paleontologists was allowed into the site. So here you can see in the image of the left, um, some of what the field work looks like. There are a lot of dirt bags in that image because that's how um, it all started. Nowadays, the field work is different. There's this giant inflatable uh, dam that can be put in the area so it's less, um, the ecosystem is not affected as much. And, but you can see how um, we're putting all these strings to separate um, every one of those squares where you can start uh, digging. And what's most important is that even though you do a lot of squares, there is no way you can either deal with all of those squares or um, get sometimes even one of them empty. But the first collection space is the one that you can see at the top right. It was small, um, very crowded. It was also the preparation place and um, the collection needed a new place to be. And it was moved to a larger space. But 
uh, unfortunately, it also had some issues um, with relative humidity and temperature, uh, mold formation, pests. So there were a lot of issues. So it's, it's again a trade-off between research and, and access uh, and then the conservation of the remains. So this place was not ideal, but it helped to start some of the outreach activities a little bit better. But what's most exciting is that at some point, um, there were some projects to bring the fossils back to the high school. So now, uh, again, the fossils are where um, this whole thing started. So this is a new collection space. Um, in the image on the left, you can see an area without windows, that's the collection. Um, and then on the right is uh, the lab, outreach, and exhibit space. And um, in the bottom image, you can see the new shelves in the collection area. Uh, the fossils are much, much happier than they were. And here you can see that there are new housing materials and techniques. Um, foam is used now to be um, to put in um, all the shelves. And even though in the bottom image you can see um, those uh, carton plast like uh, boxes and trays with, uh, that are a little bit more crowded, it's because they are ready to be mounted differently with um, the housing that you can see on the right, with, which is um, just creating these cradles uh, for the collection for each one of the, of the fossils that are more delicate and they need um, a little bit more attention. So in the image on the top, um, okay, um, you can see that uh, the fossils are very nicely uh, separated. And here you can see all the outreach activities that um, we have been doing with uh, the public. Uh, with 3D printing and augmented reality, just bringing again the public into the collection because the collection is theirs. And it's the, the goal of the collection to be part of the town of Sauce. Uh, the way that we spread information, of course, is through scientific publishing and um, some outreach activities. Now in the chat, you can see some of the, the links to the Arroyo del Vizcaino collection site and to the Megafauna 3D site. Um, where you can play with the fossils and move them around because this digitization project is absolutely wonderful. And finally, um, I wanted to say that this is, this is how the field looks. There's so many bones and it's not going to be enough space, the one that we have right now. So I think it's important to say that the collection is going to face new challenges, but the team is ready for those challenges. The collection was planned with extra room in advance so that now it's not a matter of, okay, we brought 600 bones from the field. What are we going to do with them? It's actually, you now have room for them and then you have enough time to plan ahead for um, when storage becomes an issue. So I really want to thank everybody that was involved with this project and that is still involved with the project. Down there, there are the links, but I know Martin shared them in the chat. So we're really excited to connect with all of you and to keep on making um, Latin American collections more accessible. And of course, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana, so much. That What a beautiful story, you know, with <laughs> the kids, how it started. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> and I can see in the chat, people are very excited about that. And we have a lot of questions too. Um, so there is a question from Julie Shapiro. Um, she's asking, uh, has the original field book from the students been digitized? Yes, yes, of course. Um, the, it's not only the original one, um, all of the ones that we actually created when we were in the field, um, they were digitized as well. So we have the maps and the drawings and, and all of the things that we did when we we're in the, in the field as well. Great. Uh, Rebecca Newberry um, wants to know how easy is it to get uh, the corrugated plastic and foam for the collection? It's not. <laughs> um, actually, we don't know exactly, exactly what's in um, all of those. We have to trust the vendors um, because there aren't many vendors in Uruguay. It's a very, very tiny country. Um, we don't have, uh, and also it's so down south um, that it's, it's hard sometimes to get supplies 
it's it's funny because we're inside the continent we're not anywhere else but sometimes it's hard to get those supplies because the market is also very very small so um it's it's not easy that's why we had to go with the blue ones instead of getting white because we preferred getting white because there's no dyes nor any of that but blue is what we found blue is what we use but it's better than to have them in cardboard boxes or so i think prioritizing is what matters here um, when you have a collection and you're starting it from scratch, like um, almost like what we were doing, it's about prioritizing. What can you do? You start with whatever you can, and then you keep going up. You're never going to want to start, you know, right up there um, because it's it's not going to be possible. You're going to be feeling overwhelmed, and you're not going to be able to um, to get what you wanted to get. Awesome. Um, Carol Keller, she wants to know if, um, are the fossils uh, confined to the creek? Yes. Um, okay. Mostly. Uh, so the stream bed is where all the, the fossils are. We have found that um, that stream has shifted through time. So where it is right now, it's not exactly where it was. So going to one of the sides, if we start digging through um, the sides of the stream, we can find some more fossils. So um, we know that either the stream was larger or it shifted. Um, it's part of the, of the research to find out exactly uh, the, geolog the geology, let's say, of, of how um, this happened. Okay, uh, Michael Gottfried, um, are there non-mammals and or smaller taxa in the fauna? We have not found um, anything small that was dead, let's say, because <laughs> we were saving the fish when we were, you know, pumping out the water and taking turtles out and all of that, but those were all alive. Um, and we haven't found anything small. We actually dig with our hands most of the time because we the bones have certain markings on them that um, have been interpreted as maybe uh, done by human agency. So we don't want to create any marks. So we don't use tools. I just used to lose all my nails <laughs> during the field season because it was just digging with your fingers. Um, so we are really careful about what is taken out, but the smaller mammals um, are still not there. Okay. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, sure. Ricardo Paredes from Science Museum, uh, you, you coined Brian Portugal. Uh, how do you interpret the fossil assemblage? A kind of mud trap? That is a very complicated question to answer. <laughs> There's a lot going on that we're still, still not sure about um, because of the way that the fossils are preserved. Um, we don't see the mud trap, but we don't see any transport that is, you know, too far. They're not perfectly, you know, all um, articulated either. So it's a very hard site to interpret. Um, so we're trying to find ways to get to areas that um, have not been um, dug before because we don't know exactly what happened before we arrived into the site and how um, the dig occurred and if anything, um, was moved around. So we're still trying to interpret um, the origin of how um, this assemblage was formed. Okay. Uh, Silvia Lowe wants to know if you have any types, any, if it, is there any special treatment for them? Well, we don't have types per se because all the fossils that we found had already been found elsewhere in the world. Um, but we do have some um, fossils that hadn't been found in Uruguay. Uh, but we don't have a detailed record of types because we don't have types. But those fossils are identified where they are. And mostly the collection is organized by uh, bone. So the femur is a ginormous bone in the lestron. So we keep them in you know, the lower shelves or so we have all the femora together um, like that, because it's easier also for the researchers to do some interpretations about um, uh, Lestodon as a species and all of that. So it's, if we're looking for a certain bone, it's very easy to actually go to the shelf and it's like, oh, here, 
this is the one that we need. Um, so that's the one, the way that um, this collection is organized because it's a rather uh, small collection and it was started from scratch and it's mostly one species and then small things from other species. Okay, and one last question from Christina Bird. Uh, she asked, are detailed latitude and longitude recorded to track the spread of the fossils at, along the creek and potentially through time as the creek shifts if rapid? We don't think it's, it's rapidly shifting um, too much, you know, I don't know exactly what happened in the past 200 years. Um, but we do have now uh, GPS locations and there's more tracking of the height as well. It's not a very big creek. Um, the area is around 30 square meters and expanding a little bit. Um, so it's, it's, we do have the data, but it's not a huge area that will cause um, difference in interpretation that much, but that the data is there. Great. Thank you, Mariana. That was awesome. Thank you very much. And I see Soltankov's question. I'll, um, I can yeah, answer we'll, privately. We'll keep it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me introduce uh, our next speaker. Now we're going down to Chile. And we have Carolina Pagnitrul. Uh, she's gonna talk, um, her talk is entitled Exceed Conservation of the Chilean Flora in the Inia Seed Bank, Current State and Future Challenges. So. Um, I can play the video uh, again. If you yes, give please. me one second. Um, Patricia said she's having unstable internet. So if you could play it, Mariana, that would be great. Yeah, that's, awesome. that's totally fine. We're a little early, so we have some time. Um, sure. so and I'll just not... pull out one more comment from the chat. Um, Gary Motz and I, who have also both worked in the Midwest, um, this is sort of situation with sloths and floods and droughts is very familiar to us because I think in Indiana and Iowa, we both have really similar kinds of discoveries being made. It's like, there's a drought or there's a flood and some farmer calls the museum and says, you know, these bones are coming out of the creek bed on my land. So it's, <laughs> it's a very familiar story. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I think the, the most interesting thing is when you actually have all that and it's like, what do I have in my creek? So I think it's, it's, it's great that, um, that the students were so highly involved and interested and, um, and excited about this. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I was also going to say, I'm wondering if you don't get some of the smaller things because there's some sort of taphonomic sorting going on. And there could be, yes. If they are creek bed deposits, um, you know, maybe all the smaller things are getting washed away and you're just left with the, the larger bones. So that may be it's, one reason. Yeah, so it's, it's all part of the, of the trying to understand what's going on because sometimes you get evidence for one thing and then you get evidence for another thing and you're like, but, but, but so it's a it's a complicated site to uh, to interpret. Oh, and actually, I didn't tell you, but behind me is the old collection. I have all the shelves, but the old shelves behind me today. I brought them with me. <laughs> so I feel that I'm there, even though I'm in a different hemisphere. OK, so um, how do you want to do this? Do we want to start? Do we want to? Oh, uh, yeah. Let's do we have more time for questions. Up. Actually, uh, Carolina's video is 12 minutes, so we can start right okay, now. Okay, right now. Yeah. Um, let me see where I put it. <laughs> <laughs> is it going? No, nope, it's the wrong one. He opened. How about now? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carolina, and today I'm going to tell you about the ex situ conservation of no, we're not. Okay, we the current state and future challenge of our collection. Okay, definitely shared the wrong window. Let's see. Let's do this one. Can you see it now? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carolina, and today I'm going to tell you about the ex situ conservation of the Chilean flora in our seed bank, the current state and future challenge of our collection. 
So first of all, let me show you our country. Tidelo is located in South America, and it is usually considered as a biogeographic island because it's surrounded by natural barriers, like the Atacama Desert, the and this mountain, the Pacific Ocean, and the glaciers. But additional to this continental territory, Chile has other insular territories like Rapa Nui, Desventuras, and Juan Fernandez Islands. All these conditions of biogeographic isolation have contributed to the formation of a unique flora in our country. In fact, and as you can see here, Almost half of the vascular plants in Chile are endemic, which means that grows exclusively in our territory. And so Chilean flora harbors one of the highest percentage of endemicity in South America in terms of plants. Despite of this unique global heritage, which is recognized among the global biodiversity hotspots, um, 46% of the Chilean vascular plants currently evaluated are endangered or critically endangered. That means that we need urgently to take action and obviously protect our flora. And also we would like to protect all biodiversity in natural ecosystem, ecosystems that is unlikely due to the extreme human pressure on natural ecosystems and exacerbation of these pressures through the action of climate change. So there is a need to implement other conservation measures like ex situ conservation. The ex situ conservation in the case of plants includes uh, the collection in botanic gardens and arboretums, the, the cryopreservation, and also the storage of genetic material like seeds in seed banks. And this last is one of the favorite methods because it's allowed to preserve a high genetic diversity of plants with a relatively low cost in a minimum space for long periods and also it facilitates the reintroduction of plants to the natural habitat. So seed banks has a key role in conserving the diversity of wild plant species. Okay, so now I present you our seed bank that belongs to the Instituto de Investigaciones Agropecuarias, or INIA, which is the national curator of plant genetic resource in Chile. This bank, that is this building, long-term preserved the seeds of Chilean native plants from the year 2001 until now. We cannot see the video. There is a photo of uh, part of our seed collection. And so the objective of this presentation is to analyze and show you the contribution of our seed bank in the ex situ conservation of Chilean plants and also identify the main challenge that we face. Okay, so what did we do to know the current conservation state of the Chilean flora in the seed bank? First of all, we organized the information about the accessions of seeds. The accessions are the simple of seeds collected by 37 initiatives into a database that includes data about taxa and seed management. And we carry out a nomenclature update based on the catalog of plant of vascular plants of Chile. Uh, then we determine the number of species and accession collected in each administrative region of Chile and we made a species richness spatial analysis of the accession in order to know the geographical distribution of the species that are conserved today in our uh, collection. The next step was to classify the native species according to their conservation status assigned by the National Wild Species Classification. And finally, we identify for each accession of seeds the initiative that allowed to preserve the native species in our seed bank. We classify this information into four categories, international project, private national project, public national project, and donations. After that, to know the current challenge for Chilean flora conservation in our collection, we determine the species conservation gaps and poorly represented regions. For that, we calculated the number and proportion of non conserved species by each region of Chile, like here. And then we calculated the total number of threatened species conservated and not conservated 
for each administrative region of our country. Okay, so what is the current state of the Chinese flora conserved in our seed bank? Today we have 3,040 seed accession of Chilean native species preserved in our collection, uh, which uh, is represented by 1,256 species, which is 27% of the total Chilean flora. And it is distributed in 180 families and 405 genera. Regarding the number of seeds and accession stored in our collection, we can see here that the majority of our accessions has more than 2,000 and even 10,000 of seeds, which is very important because it ensures the conservation of a representative sample of the population and allow us to develop germination protocols, to us the long-term sample viability of the seeds, and also allows the distribution of seeds uh, or accession duplicates to other seed banks. Um, what is the conservation status of the plants conserved in our collection? As you can see here in these graphs, most of the native species preserved in our collection, 55%, have not been evaluated, so we really don't know their conservation status today. Of the categorized proportion, 11% of the species are under some degree of threat. For example, it includes 10 critically endangered species, 61 endangered and 66 vulnerable species. And finally, 2% uh, of the species in the remaining collection are classified as near threatened and 2% of least concern. The, the region of the country with the highest number of collected and preserved species today are the north and central region of the country, which represents 85% of the total collection in the seed bank. And on the other hand, the region with the lowest number of collected accessions and species conserved are the south part of the country, especially this region, the ISA region, which only has 10 seed accessions and three species preserved in our collection. In the same way, in the insular territory, the number of species is here significantly lower than in the continental territory because we only have two accession of only wild, wild species conserved from the Juan Fernandez Island, which represents less than 1% of the total collection. Which are the initiatives that have contributed to the conservation of the native species in our collection? 70% uh, of our collection in terms of seed accession, as you can see here, has been collected and preserved thanks to the financing of international initiatives like Kew Garden. So thank you, Kew Garden. And 18% comes from private national project, 19, sorry, 9% from 9% for public project, and only 1% from donations. In terms of conservation gaps, we found that the central region of Chile has a high number of native species that are not preserved in the seed bank today, while the places with the lowest number are the insular territories. However, these results change when we observe the proportion of not preserved species by region, which means the, representative, the representativeness by region. In this sense, the poorly representative uh, regions are the extreme south of the continental territory, and also the insular territories, especially places like Rapa Nui and Juan Fernandez Islands, where the regional proportion of species that have not been collected are close to 100%. Then when we observe the number of treated plants, uh, the not conserved, which are the yellow one and the conserved in our collection, which are the blue ones by each region of Chile, we also know that the insular territory, that is this one, especially Juan, Juan Fernandez Islands, have the highest number of threatened species that are not collected and not preserved today in our collection. For example, Juan Fernandez, 
as um, 100 of threatened species that are not preserved today in our collection. To conclude, after 18 years of collecting native seeds, our seed bank conserved the seeds of 27% of, of the Chilean flora. About half of the collection has more than uh, 10,000 storage seeds for each accession, which is very positive because, as I told you, ensure the conservation, allow to develop germination protocol, to assess the long-term viability, and allow the distribution of accession duplicate to other seed banks. Currently, it's not possible to estimate with uh, the real level of threats with the species conserved in our seed bank because a high percentage of them have not been classified. And the conservation effort today should focus in decreasing the gap between the conserved species and those that have not been conserved, especially threatened and endemic plants. Um, the biosphere reserve of Juan Fernandez Island should be a priority site because the high number of certain plants that are currently underrepresented in our collection. And obviously the increase in the protection of native threatened species in the collection should be also complemented with the development of new methods in conservation, like cryopreservation, which could allow to conserve a new range of plants, like ferns or species with recalcitrant seeds. So that was all presentations. Thank you everybody for your attention. Thank you. That, that's beautiful. Um, Carolina, are you, are you there? Hi everyone, I'm not Carolina, but she's having some connection problems. So if you have any question, maybe I can help you. Uh, sorry, my name is Sergio Ibañez. Oh, Sergio, yes. So you are the co-author, right? Yeah, yeah. Great. So um, any questions? Um, let me see. Yes, Dirk Newman from Bavaria Natural History Collections. Um, he's asking, Chilean research infrastructures may suffer from unsustainable long-term funding. How is the situation at INEA Seed Bank? How is the collaboration among botanic collections in Chile organized? Is, is it organized, this collaboration? Mm, well, about the... Um, uh, Carolina is uh, showing this video some like the, the source of the resources of the, of the projects. Well, there are projects that uh, uh, we work in, in, uh, with the base of projects. So, uh, for example, I don't know if this was the question, but uh, the, um, uh, for, uh, the, the main collection is, uh, it came from, uh, from the, uh, this uh, Millennium Seed Bank project from Q. So uh, we work uh, using that method, like uh, working with uh, different uh, different institution that uh, show a, a project, so we participate in this project. Um, that's it. I, I don't know if th that was the question. Uh, yeah, so the question has two parts. The first one uh, refers to long-term funding and how is the INEA dealing with it? Mm, yeah. And the second part... Mm -hmm. well, um, well, with the, um, uh, with the, uh, the, the long-term work is it's very difficult because we always have to look for these fundings. Um, well, INEA and most of the Chilean institutions um, work like in, in a, they have to be self-sustainable. So uh, we are not the exception. Uh, we have to look for fundings. Uh, so uh, normally these fundings came from uh, conservation projects and also there's an important source that came from a private projects that are like a, for compensation of uh, environmental projects. Uh, for example, if you, if in Chile is going to be, I don't know, a project like a minery project or an hydroelectric project, something like that, 
uh, legally they have to make a, a study, an environmental study, to know what uh, biodiversity is going to be lost because of this project. So uh, to compensate that, um, some companies uh, sometimes they uh, they can say, for example, uh, there's a, a number uh, of endangered species in the place. So we are going to pay for a seed rescue of this population. So we enter in that in that part. But that was an, one example. Uh, there are different kind of projects, uh, mainly conservation projects. Uh, as I say, the Millennium Seed Bank project of you, mm -hmm. uh, that was a big one. And the second one, part of the question? Uh, the second part of the question, uh, he's asking uh, how is the collaboration among botanic collections in Chile, if mm. it is organized or just just by chance? I, I, now they are trying to build something. Uh, we have a new uh, minister in, in Chile. In, in, well, it's uh, relatively new. Uh, so this, uh, this minister is trying to organize all of this. Uh, they are making great efforts to uh, to make like a network, uh, a network uh, between all the like botanic gardens, uh, uh, seed banks, um, uh, things like that. But yes, I, I, I would say that now we don't have a, a strong network. Okay. And well, we, we have three more questions, but because of time, uh, we're going to answer one live. And then you can go to the Q and A section and answer and type in the the, the answers uh, uh, if you want, or we can just keep them for the for the final of the discussion. So Deborah Harding wants to know if you ever grow any of the seeds to check for viability. Yeah, yeah it's an uh, important part of the process. In the, um, all the accessions that I, that I keep it in the bank. Um, uh, they have to be checked in in time. So, for example, the, uh, in now we're looking for the oldest accession. Uh, we we keep like a, a separated part of the of the accession that is going to be conserved. So we take the, this another part that is for uh, monitoring uh, uh, to check what is uh, which is the the percentage of germination, which is the state of the seed. Um, we are record, uh, recording that, so we know the, 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 that accession, how is decreasing the germination in time. Uh, because we assume that all the accessions, uh, we keep all the, um, all, all the measures that the, the seed needs to uh, be conserved in long term. But despite that, uh, normally, uh, and depends also the species, uh, sometimes uh, this germination uh, uh, percentage uh, goes down with time okay and well okay one more time one more question <laughs> uh, yeah. julie julie shapiro wants to know what is the difficulty of getting out to the juan fernandez islands well the main difficulty is the uh, how how do you reach that islands uh, juan fernandez is uh, which is I, uh, the most important is Iceland in, in Chile in terms of biodiversity um, is like, I don't know, maybe three hours in a plane. Uh, but uh, we have commercial flights, but um, they are expensive. And of course, uh, as I said before in the, in, in the other question, uh, you need uh, funding for, for do that. Uh, so and the, the flights are expensive. Um, so yeah, I will say that uh, the main difficulty is the money, uh, as everyone, uh, everything in conservation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, thank you, Sergio. Um, we're keeping uh, some more questions here for later. Um, and let me introduce you to our next speaker. He's also from Chile. Uh, she's uh, Catalina Merino, and the title of her presentation is The Invertebrate Collection at Museo Nacional de Historia Natural, Enhancing the Collection Status with a Limited Budget. Okay, if you give me one second, I'm going to share my screen. Sure. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Just let me know when you want to move forward with the slides. 
I'm ready. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Catalina Merino. I am the collection manager of the Invertebrate Zoology Department at the National Museum of Natural History in Chile. Thank you very much for watching this presentation. Together with Andrea Martinez, prepared this to tell you about the work that has been carried out in the last five years in our department, focus on enhancing the collection status with a limited budget. Next slide, please. Well, our museum was founded in 1830 under the legal mandate to be a reference center for biodiversity. The zoology department was formed in 1889. On your left, you can see a very old showcase in which the new specimens were exhibited in 1910. Over time, as a result of limited resources, some earthquakes and limited staff, this department has been set aside for many years. As a consequence of this, the collection status was not optimal. So in 2015, the new curators who entered the department developed a project to improve the status of the collections, considering a limited budget. Four main objectives were defined to improve the storage status. First, doing a diagnosis and then improving storage environment, conservation and documentation of the collection. Next slide, please. For the methodology, the project began by gathering a team. This team was supported uh, at all time by the head curator of the department. We started each year by making a diagnosis. In terms of storage, we improved the environmental, but so, sorry, the environment by cleaning, organizing, and replacing shelves. In terms of conservation, we treated wet and dry specimens. We changed all the containers and conservative. In terms of documentation, all the information we could obtain from lots was transcribed into our software Biotica. In parallel, we registered all, all the lots worked in a spreadsheet. And since 2018, we incorporated Darwin Core standard to our documentation. We did these four steps every year independently, and we started with the type material. Um, the number of people working was changing to, due to the available budget. For the first and second year, there were two people working, and for the next few years, there were three people working. Next slide, please. The results for the diagnosis show that, in general, most of the collection were kept in poor conservation and environmental conditions. In terms of storage, almost all the shelves were made of wood and a lot of cardboard boxes, as you can see in the first and second picture. And the storage area was very disorganized. Next slide. In terms of conservation, the wet specimen were kept in formalin or ethanol, but a lot of them were evaporated. Most of them were in plastic opaque containers with inappropriate labels. For the dry specimens, on your right. Most of them were never treated before, so they were a little messy and dusty. And in ter terms of documentation, there were some paper catalogs only for the collection of crustaceans and mollusks. Next slide. In terms of the storage, uh, the results, uh, we did a lot of cleaning and organizing during the whole project. Due to the museum budget, just a few stainless steel shelves are purchased per year for our department. So we started by buying one for the tie material and then shelves with drawers for the dry collection. In 2018, we could buy the first data layer and the temperature and humidity and be monitored. Next slide. The results in terms of conservation. In five years, uh, eight, 1,800 lots were treated, including wet, and then we incorporated dry specimens. We started working with crustaceans, and then we in incorporated echinoderms, mollusks, and other groups. Next slide. Here you can see the current status of the wet and dry collections. We can see some echinoderms, some mollusks, some sponge, and some corals. Next slide, please. 
In terms of documentation, we resume the publication of catalogs that for some collection was not carried out in a hundred years. Here are some of them for the land expedition specimens, for the type material, and the echinoderms. Next slide, please. With the incorporation of Darwin Core Standard to our documentation, we published our first data set through GBIF, as you can see on your left. With all this new information digitized, we were able to perform new investigations. For example, a study of alert scale distribution patterns of echinoderms in the South Pacific Ocean, which have not been investigated until now. Among many other studies based on the collection work. Next slide, please. In 2018, we started working with a student and she helped us recover our older specimens. And we made a historic collection which contains a specimen collected by Filippi, an eighth century naturalist who described the flora and fauna of Chile. Next slide, please. Well, Today in our department, uh, there are four people working permanently, three curators and one collection manager. Considering the number of species, we have three largest collections. Each of these collections is worked by the three curators of the area. For the kind arms collection, we have the five classes represented, being the most abundant, the asteroids and echinoids. And from, for crustaceans, 86% correspond to the decapods followed by the amphipods. For these two collections, approximately 50% of the, of the existing material is available in the collection. And for mollusks, we have the eight classes represented, and the gastrop and bivalves are the most common. In this case, only the 10% is part of the collection right now. And we have many other collections with a smaller number of specimens that are worked by the same curators. And I am the collection manager of all collections and work as a research collaborator. I started yes. working in the project in the museum and the museum could hire me as a permanent staff by the end of 2018. Next slide, please. The main areas that we work are the collection, research, and we do some education and exhibition too. Next slide. And well, after all these years of hard work, we have been able to improve the state of our collection. There's still a lot of work to do, but we are moving forward. This project has very good results for us. And what's next for the future? <laughs> a bad new uh, funding for this project has been eliminated for 2020 um, because of the huge impact of COVID-19 in our country, we probably won't see it in a couple of years. So in the meantime, now that the collection is organized and protocol have been established, we will promote the participation of volunteers and thesis students. And we are going to continue working on some things such as improving labels for wet collections, improve our data quality, working on invertebrate exhibitions, among many other activities. And finally, next slide, please. What about COVID-19? Uh, thanks, Amalia, for suggesting incorporating this issue. Our staff have, has been working from home since mid-March. Most of the team can work remotely. Only EPM and security staff are allowed. We can't curate, organize, and catalog new specimens, but we are transcribing photographs, resources to spreadsheets to let it be clean and import. And we are improving our data quality by georeferencing and doing some research and preparing divulgation material. And thank you, that's all. Next slide, please. Here are some acknowledgements for, to the project and to this community. Thank you. Thank you, Catalina, that was great. Um, I had some technical difficulties and wasn't able to see all of it, but uh, part of it, <laughs> and it looks awesome. Uh, there are some questions for you here at the Q&A, so uh, let's take a look at them. Uh, first, the Rapol, uh, she wants, um, she's asking, have you got all the georeferencing protocols and standards worked out? And I'm working on it. Um, we are basing on the last 
uh, version of the geo reference uh, of the quick reference guide to update our uh, our uh, protocol of geo referencing okay. so we are working on a protocol just uh, for the museum okay Mm, Catalina Arteaga, uh, she says, thank you, Catalina, for the presentation. Uh, what kind of labels you use for the wet collections? Well, we use uh, some paper labels, 100% cotton, but we are changing the labels because uh, before we used another paper that was not acid free. So we are finding a material that allows us to, um, I don't know, improve the, the labels that we had before. So if you have any advice for this, I'm hearing. <laughs> okay, yeah, but you have improved materials. I guess okay. the durability and over time and all that. Mm -hmm. And Dirk Newman says, the Museo Nacional de Historia Natural is a very nice museum situated in a major earthquake zone. Which precautions did you take in the fluid collection to protect your museum objects? Well, we use only closed cabinets and we close, the, we close them with, uh, with a key. And we put some barriers in the shelves so, uh, to prevent the lots from falling. Okay. Um, regarding your uh, previous answer to Deborah about the georeferencing, she's saying in the chat, uh, there's a new version of the best practices guide for yeah. georeferencing, not the quick guide, but uh, another one yeah. coming out soon. So um, maybe you can See, keep that I, in your radar. Yes, I have it. Uh, John sent me that version, so I'm using both the quick reference guide and this one. Thank okay. You. And Corver M says that in New Zealand, I use rag paper. We have a stock that was there before I arrived 25 years ago and still works well. So that, that might be a tip for your paper and your materials. Um, okay, thank you. I'll write it down. <laughs> uh, there's a comment here from Ricardo Paredes from Portugal that says that three curators uh, for that collection is a good ratio is not uh, very common to have three curators. And wonderful work, wonderful yeah. talk, marvelous, thank you. So yeah, thank you, Catalina, that was awesome. Okay. Oh, oh wait, here is one more question too, actually. Uh, Daniela Franco, she says, thank you for your presentation. Do you have a specific protocol for species collection? Mm, sorry, I don't know what species collection means. I guess, I, I don't know, let me correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine it's um, when you go to the field and collect the species. Ah, okay. Yes, <laughs> um, we have a specific pro protocol and we are preparing our protocol to put it on our um, page of the museum to be available for all the community. We are writing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and Silvia Lobo, she has a question that is in Spanish. I'm gonna try to um, translate um, for everyone. She's asking why the collection was in the initial condition that was, an or was not organized and it was dirty and or all that. Yeah, uh, because of uh, there was, there was a, extremely limited stuff before. In 2015, there was a taint of curators and new curators that there were never uh, were before in the museum. So we had and, uh, some earthquakes and we had very, very little resources before. So in 2015, we could fund this project and we could improve the collection status. Okay, so thank you, Catalina. That was great. Um, and this uh, concludes the first session of our symposium.